All right, let's go in our Bibles tonight to the book of Jonah, if you would. The book of Jonah. <clears throat> and uh, one of the advantages, uh, advantages we have oftentimes in a book like or a passage like the book of Jonah is the familiarity that many have already with this incredible account. And it is an incredible story. And it literally happened. This is no fairy tale. Somebody say amen. No, sir. This is precisely what happened. And so um, we're going to begin our reading in chapter 3 and verse number 10. But first of all, let's just kind of refresh in our mind what's happened here. Let's, and we'll make this very brief. Because basically God said to Jonah, Arise and go to Nineveh and cry out against the where your wickedness has come up to me. You go out and cry out against the city of Nineveh, the capital city of the ancient Assyrian Empire. Now you go cry out against the city of Nineveh. Jonah said, I don't believe I will. So if Nineveh is this way, he went that way and headed towards Tarshish. And you know what happened. He took a boat, the storm came, uh, the sailors who were pagans themselves had the fear of God that Jonah didn't have. And finally, Jonah suggested that he get tossed overboard. They did. And there was the uh, great fish or the whale prepared by the Lord. Amen. And there have been those that have argued about the a uh, whale, the belly of a whale, this couldn't be, it wasn't a whale at all. Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale. That's good enough for me right there. And so he goes into the belly of the whale, and he's there for three days and three nights, and he is a man in misery. If you go into chapter 2, you read about him crying out to the Lord and begging God for mercy. And uh, God heard his prayer and put him out on the dry ground, and uh, he was delivered from that incredible experience, Jonah was. So uh, God came to him the second time and said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell them, give them the preaching that I have for you. You already know what you're supposed to do. Now you go. And this time Jonah said, I believe I will. Amen. I think I will. So he did. And he went to Nineveh. And he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be destroyed. And he went across this vast city, and he call, uh, called out in the name of God, called the people to repentance, and told them the judgment of God was coming. And look down in verse number 10. The people amazingly, from the king to the lowest of the citizenry, they repented and turned to God. And look in verse 10. And God... Let's stand and read, shall we? Amen. This begins our text right here about for God. So let's stand together and honor the Word of God. If you need to remain seated, that's, of course, fine. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. Amen. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry. I'll just call your attention to the fact right now that it does not say that it displeased Jonah. It says it displeased him exceedingly. Right, right. It does not say this made him angry. It says it made him very angry. Right, right. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God Amen. and merciful. What a reason to be angry with God. Amen. Slow to anger and of great kindness and repentance thee of the evil. Now, therefore, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. <laughs> then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord prepared a gourd and made it to come over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad. He wasn't glad. He was exceeding glad right. of the gourd. But 
God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Amen. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? And there we have the, maybe the strangest ending of any book in the Bible. It just ends. I've had people said, whatever happened to Jonah? I said, well, what does the Bible say happened to Jonah? Well, it doesn't say. Well, exactly what would you like for me to say? I'm like, I don't know. Because really, probably, it's not so much about Jonah now, that his uh, record has been settled a long time ago. Amen. But yours hasn't, right. and mine hasn't. And maybe the whole idea is that God wants us to get this Amen. and finish the story differently, the Lord. perhaps, than we see the ending, as far as we know, of Jonah right here. And Lord, we ask you one more time for the help and the unction yes, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And that you would help me to speak and to bring the message yes. across in a way that would be clear and uh, that we could, uh, could receive from you and that we would then have a proper response to how you might speak to our hearts Amen. tonight. So we again thank you for the precious word. Thank you for the songs that we've been able to sing together tonight Amen. and the ministry and music. God's been such a blessing that this, these entire days from Sunday through now. And we praise you and thank you for it. Now bless this time together in the Word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. God bless you. You may be seated. <clears throat> you would think that a whale's belly experience would change a man forever. Now, wouldn't you? Is this on? Amen. I'm going to run that by one more time. You would think that a whale's belly experience would change a man's life forever. How, how could you go through what he literally went through and not be changed and affected forever? Amen. Now, a couple of things changed. Uh, Jonah's direction changed. Right. When the whale put him out on the ground, he went the direction he was supposed to do and wound up going to the city of Nineveh. And his activity changed. Instead of running from God, then he traveled in pursuit of doing what God had for him to do in the city of Nineveh. So I grant you that, that after the experience in the belly of the whale, then his uh, direction changed, he went the right way, and his activity changed. He started doing what God told him to do. But something very significant and important did not change. His attitude. His attitude did not change. And attitude, just a little reminder here, attitude has to do with a mental posture. It has to do with a mental position or a mental disposition, an attitude. And many of us in our upbringing, perhaps, were taught about the importance of a proper attitude. Not just that we would do what we were told to do, but have the right attitude. 
Uh, forgive the illustrations, again, of uh, a personal nature, but I have one that sticks clear in my mind when my, I had a sister two years older than me, a sister two years younger than me, and in their upbringing, when they got to a certain age, they spent most of their time in front of the mirror checking their makeup or their face or their uh, complexion and stuff like that. Now, that's what I remember. They denied that, but I remember that. And therefore, uh, I, while I was working and doing chores and milking cows and doing all the things I was supposed to do, my sisters were, I thought, just the laziest people you ever saw. But they did have their chores they were supposed to do. And one night I'd finished all of mine, supper was over, and it was still light. And my mother said to me, I got, grabbed my basketballs, headed out to play basketball outside. And my mom said, Sam, before you play basketball, you help your sister, my little sister Judy, help her get the clothes off the line. Well, well, they didn't help me do any chores. I wasn't very spiritual minded then, and you probably think not now either. But anyway, I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking, this is not right. I want to go play basketball. I've done everything I'm supposed to do in the way of my chores. And so I knew there's no use arguing, so I put my basket, well, I sort of put my basketball down. I took my basketball on the sidewalk, and I, <clears throat> because I was mad about it. I'm going to have to go uh, help my sister. The basketball bounced about 20 feet in the air, and then I grabbed one of the closed baskets. I accidentally knocked my sister down, and, <laughs> and uh, then I go out there, and I start pulling the clothes off of the line and throwing them in the basket, and some of them are going in the grass. I pick them up and throw them in, and I get it all done. Now, remember last uh, couple of nights ago, I mentioned that my dad called me dumb kid. He, well, here's one of the reasons probably he did that. I kind of forgot that mom was standing right in the kitchen window and saw the basketball go high in the air and felt it necessary to get my dad involved in the situation. So by the time I got the clothes in, my dad's waiting for me at the porch and I, before I could take the clothes in. Now, what do you think my dad said? How do you think he approached this? I guarantee you it wasn't this. Well done, thou good and faithful son. <laughs> You have done everything thy mother asked thee to do, which I did. I did. I went and helped her. I got the clothes off. I probably took off more than she did. Got the basket of clothes in, took it in the house. That's what I was supposed to do. But what was the problem? Why was it my dad didn't greet me in such a manner? And in fact, it was a quite a different greeting. And I don't think I saw my basketball for two or three weeks after that. That was part of the punishment. And so what was the problem there? If a man does or a son does what he is supposed to do and he is, uh, fulfills the responsibility, then what is the problem with my parents? One big thing, attitude. Right. My mental disposition. Right. My mental posture. My mental position, it was absolutely wrong, and so my parents set it out to set it right. Now, here we have an account where Jonah preached. The people responded to the preaching the and repented, the Lord. and God spared a city Amen. he was about to destroy. Right. And I'm just saying, there's only one thing that keeps this from having a happy ending right. in this account right. like it should have. Right. And it was the attitude right. of our man by the name of Jonah. That's what it was. Everything was accomplished. Jonah went, he preached, the people fell under conviction of their wickedness and repented, and God responded like he said he would, and he spared them of their judgment. And so why doesn't this have a happy ending? Because of Jonah, that's why. Amen. And the attitude of his servant was very important to God. Amen. And I'll just go ahead and say right now, the attitude of his children Praise and of Lord. servants of God and those that are supposed to be disciples or followers Amen. of Jesus Christ, the attitude is still of utmost importance. Amen. Now we're going to dig into this a little bit tonight about the problem with Jonah. He did not share the same attitude about the fate of Nineveh. He did not share the same attitude as God right. about the fate of Nineveh, uh, of Nineveh. See, God saw a people that could, according to his abundant kindness, patience, long-suffering, slow to anger, right. mercy, right. 
Then God saw a people that had the potential to repent should the message go forth. And so Nineveh then heard the coming destruction that was upon them yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be destroyed. And the scripture says that Nineveh repented. Now look in verse number 10 of chapter 3 again. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. The word for that is repentance. They turn from their evil way. Can I have your attention? Their mind, their attitude themselves, Amen. their thinking about God changed, Amen. and then the action changed. And they repented of the evil works uh, that they were doing and turned from those evil works. Repentance starts with a change of mind and then it's action. It doesn't start with a change of action. It starts with a change of mind. It's in, it's in the definition of the word. All right, And so God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, that's repentance, and then look what it says. And God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Now, you know that there are several times that the scripture says that God repented. And uh, to our ears at first, that sounds real strange to us. Now, we understand why the people of Nineveh repented. We understand why we must repent Amen. and be converted. Amen that our sins might be blotted out. Amen. Anybody that is saying they're preaching the gospel and they don't give a call to repentance is, uh, is way amiss right. uh, of a complete gospel message right. because repentance is demanded. Uh, repentance toward God in relation to our sin and faith in Jesus Christ. Right. Now that's what the Bible teaches. Right. And there are those that say, oh, no, I remember an argument among fundamental Baptists about 20 or so, 30 years ago, and there was this big discussion about was it necessary to repent. My soul, I never dreamed that there would be people that could read the Bible and wonder if God required repentance. And so here, anyway, I can't get into that discussion right now. Here, uh, the people of Nineveh repented, and then God repented of the evil that he said that he would do to them. Now, somebody said, does God repent? Well, let's see. Uh, the world was uh, filled with wickedness. I just read this yesterday morning in the book of Genesis, and uh, the world was full of wickedness, and the hearts of man were uh, the thoughts of man in his heart were only evil continually. Amen. And it repented God that he had made man. Amen. Now that's what the Bible says. We've got to do something with that. We can't act like it's not there. Right. Oh, what does that mean? All right, and so here we have another account, and, and there are others, and it repented God uh, toward the city of Nineveh that he would destroy it. When he saw their repentance, then God said, I repented the evil that I was going to bring upon them, right. the judgment that I was going to bring upon them. So does God really change his mind? Uh, well, the full revelation of the Word of God says that God doesn't flip-flop like we do. Now, come on. Uh, how many of you, the last time you ever needed to repent of anything is when you got saved? And you've never had to repent since then. Anybody like that? If so, we need, we're going to counsel you after church tonight. Uh, but no, we repent again. You know why? Because we're up and down and we're hot and cold. And we're obedient and disobedient. We're, we're willing and then sometimes stubborn. Come on. We have this propensity and this and this ability in us. And so there are times that I've confessed that from the time I got saved when I was six years old to this present day, there are things I've had to come before God and say, I've been on track. My mind has been astray. I have not followed thy word in this area or this area or another area under which I come under conviction. And I repent of that before God. And so we can kind of, I think we can say without sounding too negative, I think we can say that we are are capable of flip-flopping. Right, right. We're this way for five years and then this way for a year. We're on fire for two years and then six months later, after that two years, we need revival again. Come on, we flip-flop back and forth. Right, right. God never. Praise the Lord. I said God's not flip-flopping back and forth. Oh, I didn't know they would do this and so this. Uh, so try to look at it like this. With God, he, ha he has, for example, this is the place of judgment. This is a place uh, where if you are living here, then you are sure to have my judgment upon you. Excuse me just a second. This is the place of blessing. Amen. 
And if you live here, you're sure to know my blessings upon you. In how many ways could we describe? But I'm just saying, you, you, are, you are going to know my blessings. So let's say that there is someone here, and they are living and dwelling right here in disobedience to God and in displeasure to God. So what do we know is coming? Severe chastening. God is going to deal with them. He is not going to tolerate that his children defy him and thumb their nose at him. They're fixing to get it. You understand what I'm saying? Now that's hick talk, but I'm just going to give it a try anyway. They're fixing to get it. And so here's where they are. But let's say they come under conviction as they hear the word of God and they come to the altar or at their pew and they get down before God and they repent of that attitude and they move over here. Now, since they moved over here, is God going to deal with him now as he was before? No. Not because God moves back and forth, but because the sinner can go from there to here. And if we remove ourselves from there under the conviction of the Holy Ghost and we come here with a sincere heart, then we're in store for the blessings. He repents of the evil that was going to be upon us or the, uh, the uh, chastening or the pain or however he was going to deal with us. He's got many ways. However he was going to deal with us and we move here. And so God doesn't change. He calls upon the sinner to make the change. He calls upon the stubborn to make the change. He calls upon the selfish to make the change. He calls upon the uh, rebellious to make the change. Amen. Everybody with me here? Right. So what did the Ninevites do? They changed. Amen. Praise the Lord. They changed. God doesn't delight in judgment. Praise the Lord. So says his word. Amen. He delights in mercy. Right. I mean, Jonah himself said, I knew that you were a merciful God. Right. I knew that you were exceedingly patient and kind and long-suffering and all of that kind of thing. And so here we have the fact that the people repented. So God, now let's look at it again. Verse 10, God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and the gracious and good and long-suffering and merciful God Amen. Uh, uh, repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Praise the Lord. Question. 120,000 people spared from the judgment of God. Praise the Lord. Well, they were Assyrians. Now, don't go talking like Jonah. It doesn't matter who they are. They're human Amen. souls, and they didn't deserve hell any more than you and I deserved hell. 120,000 people repented before God. God was pleased with their repentance. He was pleased to forgive them. Let me give you a verse to remember. God does not delight in judgment. Amen. He delights in mercy. You said you already said that once. Right, I know. I'm just trying to get it in, in here and make it very clear. God delights in that. So after, okay, let's look at After Nineveh repented, what do you think is the uh, posture, the mental posture, or the thinking of God? I should have gone ahead and killed him. Or did he delight in their repentance? You know he delighted in their repentance. But Jonah wasn't quite there. He wasn't there. Look down at verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Now, let me try to explain something here. I don't mean to overwork it and belabor something that's not important. But you've got to understand that jo Jonah was not like, oh, shucks, I was hoping they wouldn't get saved. Well, so I said, why would he not want them to get saved? Well, well let's be fair. Let's try our best to be fair with Jonah because uh, the Assyrians and his nation had a history. And the Assyrians who expanded their ancient empire did it sort of the way Putin is trying to expand the Russian empire back to its former <coughs> glory. And so here is the Assyrian empire that if you check the history, why well, they, they have been ruthless towards the Jews and ruthless towards Israel. And the Jews have suffered at their hand before. And they were among the enemies uh, of the Assyrians who wanted to expand their empire. And the Jews were not very much uh, accommodating about that. And so there was conflict there. And there was great hostility there. 
And so now it's God speaking to Jonah and say, I want you to go to a people that your people that you despise, Jonah, and that your people despise, but I want you to go as my servant and call them to repentance. And Jonah did it. And when he saw the forgiveness that God bestowed upon them, he was uh, displeased exceedingly. Now, if displeased is this big, you study the words out yourself. If displeased is this big, exceedingly displeased is this big. Right. Okay? And now look down in verse number one. And he was very angry. Now the adjective, I guess it's an adjective, it looks like it to me, very has to do with his anger. He is very angry. Can I have your attention? If angry is this big, very angry is this big. Right. So you have to understand where Jonah was here. Or when he saw that Nineveh, was not destroyed, and that the people repented, he was exceeding displeased, and he was very angry. And I think if we could just get a mental picture in our mind of what Jonah was going through, it wasn't like he was standing around disappointed with his shoulders slumped. He was stomping mad, kicking the dirt mad. He was just furious the fact that these people got saved, and he said, dare speak like this to God. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray the old Lord. I knew it, I knew it. This was my saying when I was yet in my country. You want to know why I ever ran to Tarshish? I knew he was this kind of God. I thought to myself, if I go preach to those people, you know what, it'd just be my luck that those people would repent and get right with God and they wouldn't be destroyed. And there's no way I'm going to do that. And now I've gone and done it and God did exactly what I thought he would do. And he's mad about this situation. Verse 3, therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. You know what I think he's doing here? I think he's just putting on a little too much drama. Okay, if this is the way you're going to work, God. I want to die. That's a bunch of hot air. He didn't want to die. Somebody said, well, you don't know that he didn't want to die. Well, I do. I think I do. Uh, number one, he already knew beforehand, yes or no. He said he did. He already knew beforehand the kind of God that God is, and it was very likely that these people might repent and be spared. Did he know that or not? Amen. Why did he go to Tarshish? Because he knew God was like this. That he was willing to forgive people that he himself hated and wanted to see them come under the judgment of God. And he knew that. And so what I'm saying is, knowing God was already that way, then he winds up going into the belly of the whale. But he gets in the belly of the whale and he's there three days and three nights. And I want to say, if you wanted to die, you had a good chance. Because surely just a few more hours and he'd have been done. But what's he doing in the belly of a whale? Saying, well, maybe I'll just die here and I won't have to put up with seeing the Ninevites get saved and all of that. Maybe I'll just die here. No, no, no. You've got to read all of chapter 2. I'm not going to take time to do it, but you read it. If it's not fresh on your mind, read it later, and you'll see that Jonah was there crying out to the Lord. Excuse me, making vows to God. Yeah, making vows to God. And so now that the Ninevites have been spared and the city is not going to be destroyed at this particular time, since that is so, then Noah says, well, Lord, I just want you to, it's better for me to die. Just go ahead and take my life. I'm going to say, you blow hard. You don't want to die and you know it. Now look how the Lord deals with him. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? Can I have your attention up here? Talk about a patient, long-suffering God. This is how he answers Jonah. If you and I had been in the stead of God, uh, we might answer different than that. But here's our patient God. Doest thou well to be angry? It's not like that God didn't know this man. <laughs> Doest 
Doest thou well to be angry? So look what Jonah does. Verse number five. So Jonah went out of the city. He, he gets out of Nineveh. They've repented. Things have happened. I mean, their wickedness, their idolatry, their immorality, their vile lifestyle, from the king to the lowest pauper, they've all repented of their sin in sackcloth and ashes uh, before God. And Jonah went out of the city, and he sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth. He went out there and made a little lean-to. A booth, you check it out yourself, it would be a little, you know, makeshift shelter type thing. And he made him this booth. Maybe poles the uh, roof this way, maybe uh, going, covering him up partly, but still open on the sides and stuff like that, or at least a couple of the sides. And so he made himself this booth, and he was there in the booth, and he sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. Question, I have a question for you. What did he think was going to become of a city that repented? Well, what are they going to, excuse me, if they have turned from their sin and their wickedness, he's going to sit there and wait and see what might become of the city. Well, what do you, I wonder what he's expecting to become of the city. I think maybe he was hoping a couple of things, they'd dive right back into sin and God would judge them, or that his attitude would affect the mind or the thinking of God and that God would go ahead and destroy them anyway. In other words, he didn't think the story was done yet because he went out and prepared him a booth and sat there to see what? What would become of the city? And I have no doubt in my own heart and mind, you can study that and come to your own conclusions. I think we can might maybe have differing opinions here just a little bit and still have fellowship. This doesn't really determine whether we go to heaven or not. This is kind of read into the story and just see, why is this man sitting here and to see what will become of the city? Is there anything in you that makes you think he is hoping for the best? No. Is there anything in you that you can see here that make me hope, uh, maybe he is hoping against hope that God will reverse the situation and he would get to see the destruction of this people that he hates? I think that's pretty much where he was. So he builds him a booth to see what will become of the city. And he waits there. And he waits. Now, look down in verse 4. Uh, I mean, verse 5. Jonah went out of the city and he sat there. And verse 6. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that he might be a shadow, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. I have a question. Was he glad about the gourd? No. He was exceeding glad about the gourd. Remember exceeding angry? <laughs> what do you think exceeding glad is? Oh, no. Exceeding glad, it's a strong expression. I'm not trying to read into it. Just look at the definitions of the word. It's exceeding glad when he saw the gourd that would come up. Now, let's talk about that gourd just a second. I'm thinking of the gourds back in Noble County, Oklahoma, when we go after the cows in the heat of summer, and the gourd vines would grow out there in the weedy part of the pasture, and these little gourds about yay big around would go. My buddy and I took them on a fishing trip and decided to do a survival diet one time. We tried to eat some of those gourds. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, just put it to your tongue and you're done with that thing. But it was hard. And what I found out it was really good for is if the cows are in the marshy part of the pond when it's time to milk and they won't come out, I'm not going to go out there and risk my life about these big snakes that I was sure was in there. So you just pick up a pocket full of gourds and you chunk them. I think that's how I learned to throw a fastball, a curveball, knuckleball, the whole thing. <laughs> it's throwing those gourds at the cows. And so those are gourds. And they ran along the ground. This was not one of them. This is a different species entirely. This would have been a large one. This one would grow. And in this incredibly dry and arid place where Jonah was at Assyria, I've talked to men that have been there that were in the Iraq War, took some time of leave, and actually went to this location, the ancient Nineveh of Assyria, and they said, it's as ugly as anything you can imagine. 
It is dry, it is dirty, it is ugly, and there's basically nothing there. And so I picture Jonah on this hill, and he is sitting there in this ugly place, and it is dry, and it is hot, and then God makes a gourd to come up over him, and it had to be a significant enough plant that it would bring him some shade with a little bit of humidity, a little bit of moisture, maybe the smell of something green and alive in this dreadful place. And Jonah was so happy about that. Well, he goes, come on, you see this gorgeous grow up? It comes out that overnight. And Jonah knew God well enough to know that that didn't just happen. This isn't some freak thing that happens out here in the desert. He knew that God was at work. Right. And so he said, see, this is God's approval over my attitude uh, towards the city of Nineveh. Why else would he give me this? Smell it, friends. Why else would he give me this shade? Why else would he give me this pleasantry here. Oh, this is so good. Thank you, Lord. I'm almost sure that's what was going on in his heart as he was exceeding glad about the gourd. thing about Jonah is, you know, he's kicking the dirt mad, but when he's glad, he's jumping up and down. He's shouting, I'm afraid to demonstrate anymore. Number one, I'm running out of gas. And number two, I think you think I'm crazy anyway. So I'm, I'm just going to imagine the kind of uh, gyrations that he was going through to express, express his excitement, his joy. This is so good. Oh, man, he is a happy man over a gourd. Uh, stop right here. Do you see a problem? 120,000 living souls were just spared the judgment of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And a gourd grows over his head. Yes! He goes from that extreme to this extreme. Over a gourd plant that grows over his bald head. Now, how do I know he's bald? I saw it in a children's picture storybook. I, I, I'm almost sure he was bald. <laughs> but do we see anything wrong here? This is, Jesus said, as Jonah the prophet, that's quite a testimony coming from Jesus, declared this man to be a prophet. Well, no, I, when I think of prophets, I think of Jeremiah and I think of Isaiah. I understand. Moses, oh, yeah, I, I do too. And when we list our heroes of the prophets, how many put Jonah right up there? You don't. But what did Jesus say? Amen. He was a prophet. Amen. So what was he? He was one of God's prophets. Amen. And 120,000 people are spared the judgment of God, and he is upset and angry as can be, and one gourd comes up to give him some comfort and what he thinks is approval of his mindset towards the Ninevites from God, and the gourd grows over him, and he is elated. Just uh, so elated. Right. Well, read on. <clears throat> now, verse 7. But God... If you read the whole book of Jonah, you, you see that phrase quite a bit. But God, Amen. he prepared a, a storm and he prepared a great fish. God did a lot of preparation to try to help this man. <laughs> but God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day. And it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat down upon Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better. Here we go again. Here it is. It is better for me to die than to live. Now, why would you rather die? The gourd's gone. This is a prophet of God. I would rather die than be without the gourd. Utterly amazing. Till God says to him in verse 9, Doest thou well to be angry? If there's such a thing as a drama queen, I guarantee you Jonah's the drama king. And here he is asking to die. And, and God asks him the question, Are you, I mean, you're ready to die over a gourd? 
Are you serious? Now, let's stop and see. What is God doing here? Why, why would he give him the gourd and then take away the gourd? What, what is this all about? Why would God be doing this? Well, I think what God is doing is he is pulling the cover off of the real issue of Jonah's life. And the real issue, I want you to listen to this carefully because we're getting to right at the heart of, in my estimation, right at the very heart of the purpose of this account. And what God is doing is he's pulling the cover off and exposing that Jonah is one selfish man. He is consumed with himself. Amen. He is not concerned that 120,000 people were about to perish. Nor is he rejoicing that 120,000 people avoided perishing right. and are now forgiven by his God. Right. He is not concerned about that at all. He is concerned only about himself. And if we look at the situation, then we can see the selfishness of Jonah that is rising to the surface here. Because as you look at the count, it becomes very clear that the will of God was not near as important to Jonah as his own will. Right. You see, manifestly, what God has done is executed his purpose and his will. God is not just concerned about Jews. I mentioned this the other night, that God situated, I could preach about this from another one of the prophets, but God situated Israel where they were so that they could show the glory of God and the kind of God the real God is, the true God is, to all the nations of the world. When he made the covenant with Abraham, he didn't just give the blessings to the nation of Israel and promise them blessings alone. He said, I'm going to make you a blessings to all the nations and all the lands and all the peoples. And that's why God called them. That's why he situated them where they were. Amen. And so here is God who is a missionary hearted God. And he cares about the Ninevites, wicked and evil as they were. And in his own divine will and his own divine purpose, he wanted to send his prophet there to show the kind of God he is. And if they repent of their sin, then they will live here instead of here. And that's what he wanted. Amen. Excuse me? That meant nothing to Jonah. Jonah was consumed with himself. Right. And his will, the destruction of Nineveh, was far more important to him than God's will, the deliverance of Nineveh. That's selfishness. Right. That's self-centeredness. God said, you are angry over a gourd? You rejoice over a gourd that lasted 24 hours? And you can't rejoice over 120,000 souls delivered from the wrath of God? Amen. Prophet? Selfishness. Second thing about his selfishness. His comfort is more important than God's compassion. Right. If you're a prophet, excuse me just a second. If you're a prophet, you could use this for a long time preaching, calling people to repentance and just show, you know what a gracious God and compassionate God, God is? You know that uh, Assyrian Empire? You know that chief city called Nineveh that's full of wickedness? It was like a cesspool of iniquity uh, there in Assyria, about 100 and 200 miles north of Babylon. Uh, yeah, you, you know that place? You know what, God? He is such a compassionate God. He is willing to forgive those people and pardon them of their sins. Praise Excuse me. But Amen. Jonah's com comfort was more important to him than his compassion. I, I call your attention to this. He went out and built him a booth. What, what are you doing here? Build me a booth. I mean, you're a prophet of God. You got a whole bunch of people here who just got converted. Yeah, well, what do you want me to do about it? Well, how about some discipleship lessons? 
They're just finding out where the book of Genesis is. I mean, come on, so to speak. And so, you, yeah, you could be down there preaching them, showing Amen. them more, teaching them right. more about God. I mean, you, you have the law. You have the whole word of God in your hand. You have the, you're Amen. a prophet. You could be down there showing them the way of the God that just forgave them. Amen. That he's been known to do, this, to do this. To deliver the undeserving. To forgive the sinful. And God is willing to make something of your life that you never dreamed. And of your city that you couldn't even imagine. He could have been doing that. But nope. Nope, nope, nope. I'm going to build me a little booth up here and uh, protect myself from the elements, the sun and the wind that would have been in that place, maybe uh, had sides to it that keep the sand from blowing through. And he was concerned. His, com his comfort was more important to him than God's compassion. Right. Don't be too shocked. Don't be too shocked. Uh, secretary of uh, Southwest Baptist Church. She was a, a pastor secretary when I was a pastor for, I don't know, 11 years, something like that. 12 years later, she's still the pastor's secretary. And she and her husband, precious people, they have only one daughter. She went to Heartland Baptist Bible College and one child. And, and she went to Heartland Baptist Bible College and she married a young man from the Kansas City area. And today... Uh, Cameron and, and um, Hannah are in Mongolia. Just have come through the winter. Uh, rigid, strict um, COVID re restrictions. Uh, poverty. Uh, just, just incredible. Incredible. And, uh, and God's using them. They're to working together with another missionary. It's been there a while. Uh, the uh, relationship developed really, really well. And, you know, everybody, we're all excited about the future ministry there and reaching people and establishing Amen. churches there in Mongolia. And uh, guess where her parents are on this issue, David and Kelly? Well, would they rather have those three little grandsons? I mean, they got three dandies. Three little grandsons, would they rather have them there where... Grandma could hug them, and Grandpa could teach them some stuff, and they could have all that good time together. Oh, yeah, they would love that, but it's not to be. And they're just thrilled yeah. that their daughter and son-in-law want to serve Jesus Amen. and live for the Amen. Lord. Amen. But I could tell you of other grandparents that I met and parents. I don't remember my kid, remember my kid going to Bible college. You can get there and call them to some heathen land somewhere. Well, you don't have to leave our shores to find a heathen land. Somebody help me, please. Amen. But I'm just saying, well, they might send them off somewhere. Well, there are people there that don't hear the gospel like you do. There are people there that don't have Bibles in their home like right. you do. Yeah, well, I mean, yes, that's true, but I mean, I really don't want, I don't want my kids or grandkids going look, over there somewhere, wherever the faraway place pagan land might be. I wouldn't want that for sure. Why don't you just wear a sign? I'm selfish. Because my comfort and what I really want and desire is far more important than people knowing the compassion of God that I know. See? And what's God doing? He's revealing the selfishness of Jonah. Making it very clear. Yeah. And, 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 and not only that, what he's really exposing here. And showing about Jonah is that his, he wants to experience God's deliverance. He just doesn't want anybody that he doesn't like to experience it. But Jonah, how could you be this way? Friend, how, what, what are you doing? You were in the belly of that whale. And God, you cried out to God. And he heard your cry from the depths of that ocean with the seaweed about your head. He says so. And, and, and God heard your cry. And miraculously, God delivered you out. And the whale spit you out on the ground. And you're saved and you're delivered. Jonah, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, well, yes, it is. And I'm thankful. I want that. I just don't want it for them. I'm just saying his selfishness is not like it's hid down there somewhere. It's pretty much laying on the surface for all to see. And God's dealing with him about his own selfishness. 
Let me just uh, say right here. And let you chew on this for just a minute. Nothing is more unlike Jesus than selfishness. I said nothing is more unlike Jesus than selfishness. If he was anything, I want to quickly qualify, he's everything. But if he is anything, he is selfless. When he came to this earth, earth, if he was anything, he was selfless. Selfless. And nothing is more unlike Jesus than selfishness. Well, I don't know that I would say selfishness is the most, uh, uh, I, I didn't say the most. I said there's nothing more unlike Jesus than selfishness. And people want to talk about immoral behavior. Of course that's unlike him. But not more unlike him. People fall into moral misbehavior because of their own selfish desires and their selfish lusts. I'm going to stick with it. I don't think anybody could prove that wrong. That nothing is, there are many things as unlike Jesus. There are many things that are unlike Jesus. But nothing more than a self-centered life. And that's where Jonah is. So why is he living in the Word of God? You said yourself, Jonah's uh, record is settled a long time ago. And why didn't he finish the story different? Because maybe he wants us to finish the story. Amen. The record of our own life, the, 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 the testimony of our own life. You see, because in, in the account, you not only see the fact that he is selfish, but watch this, I want to show you, and then we're going to quit. But I want to show you that he reveals to us the symptoms of the selfish soul. It's, it's there. Right. The symptoms of the selfishness. Listen to this. Verse 5, he quit. He left the city, went up on a hill, built him a booth, and sat down to see what would happen to the city. Can I have your attention? He quit. I can show you where God told him to go into Nineveh, but nobody can show us where God told him to go outside right. the city. <laughs> that was all Jonah. Right. I submit there was still work to do in the city of Nineveh right. in the area of teaching them of the nature of the Amen. God who just forgave them. Right. Much that they could be taught. And Jonah should have been able to teach them. Nope, nope. he didn't get his way. He quit. Right. Selfish people quit. Right. Right. Well, I mean, I'm here in church tonight. I, I, I get it. I understand it. I am thankful. What a nice attendance. I'm glad about that. But I'm just telling you right now, it is possible to never miss a service and have quit on God. Right. Just like I said the other night, it is possible to attend every service and yet have not been drinking at the fountain of living water. And by the same token, you can be a self-centered life and still be a member of almost any Baptist church. And you can attend the services and still make it all about yourself. In fact, one of the horrendous things about this whole account is rather than the focus being upon the graciousness and the goodness of God, the focus is primarily upon the selfish prophet. When you mention Jonah the prophet, very, uh, very few people think about the book of Jonah and think about the forgiveness of God, the grace of God, the patience of God, the long-suffering of God. Right. What do most people think about? Right. The weirdo Jonah. Well, he was weird. Right. This is bizarre behavior. And that's what most people think about. And he quit. Selfish people quit. Mm -hmm. I've seen people quit teaching. Now, at some point, maybe a person is supposed to move on to another type of ministry. I'm not saying everybody that's ever been a Sunday school teacher was supposed to be a lifetime Sunday school teacher. I'm not able to determine that. But was it a spiritual decision? Was this the moving of God? Or did you look at the circumstances and you got tired of dealing with parents or you got tired of making the visits or you got tired of preparing the lessons or you got tired of the attitude of kids nowadays? Or what was it? Why'd you quit? 
Well, because I, I just something I, I well I, I I that's where he was. I I I shouldn't have to go through this. I'm a prophet of God. I gave up a lot. Yeah, you gave up dying at the bottom of the ocean in the belly of a whale. That's what you gave up. To come, come on, somebody help me, please. And, and to preach here in the city of Nineveh, I shouldn't have to be going through. So I shouldn't have to, that gourd should have never died. That gourd lived, I'd have a different attitude, I guarantee. <laughs> can you see what is happening? I mean, Pastor, can you imagine if, if, if this Sunday 120 people got saved and you went home and a limb had blown off your tree and messed up the neighborhood again? And you go home, and all of your joy is gone because the limb uh, uh, fell off the tree. And now you're going to have to go through the trouble explaining to the neighbors and having the tree fixed and all that kind of thing. And, and, but, but, Pastor, you had 120 people got saved on Sunday, and there are people that are now the children of God, born again, going to heaven. I don't care. My tree was wind blew the, on Sunday of all places, of all times. I mean, how excited would you get for 120 people? How about 100? Amen. What if you was able to preach a crusade and 120,000 people get saved Amen. about that quick? Right. I don't think I'd be much focusing on gourds. What about you? Amen. Or blowing trees right. down, stuff like that. No. That's where Jonah is. He quit. He's a quitter. Well, you don't, you don't understand what happened to me. I'm sure it's unique to what has ever happened to anyone at any time. That didn't go for so good, so I'll try, try to think of it another way. Well, you, you don't know the experience I had. Do I understand that there can be painful experiences in trying to serve the Lord? Yes. Do I understand there can be some disappointments in trying to help people and lead people to Jesus and help God's people be encouraged? Do I understand there are some disappointments? Yes. Do I understand that a man might be betrayed once in a while and somebody you thought was all the way with you was not with you at all, even from the beginning? Do I understand that? Yes, I understand that. But what's that got to do with what God called me to do or what God's called you to do? You see, it's not just to preachers. It's Amen. to you. Jesus would Amen. say, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. He's going to make disciples of us. We're, we're to embrace his teaching, and we're to follow him. And we're to deny ourselves. If any man come after me, let him deny himself Amen. and take up his cross. And I said, if any man, words of Jesus, if any man come after me, let him deny myself. Well, I'm not comfortable with this, or I just think they should have done that. Deny yourself. Right. Amen. Right. Good. Have you quit? I haven't quit going to church. Well, if you're mad about it, you may have other issues. <laughs> <laughs> That's always is, uh, amusing to me, but anyway. Do you tithe? Yes, I tithe. Whoa. Whoa. Who are you mad at about that? But I'm just saying, have you quit? Selfish people quit. It's right here. Amen. This isn't the only account, but it's the one we're dealing with tonight. And Jonah quit. Strong symptom of selfishness. Out in the country, summer Sunday afternoons, neighbors across the road had a pasture out there, and the corner of it right by the road was perfect for if they had time to get out there and mow it a little bit, perfect for Sunday afternoon softball. Guys in the neighborhood come. And I remember my brothers, uh, there was a certain family that had a couple boys, and my brothers hoped they didn't come. Do you know why he hoped they didn't come? Because when they didn't get their way every Sunday, then they went home and told their parents, we quit. What do you do? Well, did you all have a good time? We quit. Why? Because those Davison boys won't let us do what we want to. We wanted to pitch. So, well, if they don't get their way, which my brothers didn't because my brothers wanted their way. <laughs> but whatever. They, but we're the, putting the thing together. And they quit. There are people that treat the Lord just like that. Treat church work just like that. Treat church life just like this. This would be a good thing to talk about on Wednesday night when the church family's together at a time like this. Have you quit? Don't quit. Amen. Well, it just upset me. We'll get upset and then get over it and serve the Lord. Amen. Another way to say it is grow up. That's what I was told when I was a kid growing up. Grow up. In fact, I can remember a number of years ago whining at the house to my wife. We'd probably been married 30 years. 
And I thought, well, at least I got a sympathetic ear. Here, you know what she said? Grow up. And went on about her work. I know everybody loves her more now, you know. I understand how that works. But it's true. Well, but I, 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 I got hurt. Jesus never told you you wouldn't. Right. Amen. Yeah, but uh, I, I found out that some of the people that seem to be like they're the most spiritual are sometimes phony. Jesus had a phony among them. That the disciples didn't even know he was there as a phony. Right. Amen. Okay, so you don't like that. Go on. Praise the Lord. Don't quit. Amen. Look at me. Jesus hadn't failed you. Right. I'm serving Amen. Jesus. Praise then you ought, it ought to be a prolonged thing. Amen. It, there ought to be a lot of longevity because he's Amen. never going to fail you. Amen. He never has. Amen. He's not even capable Thank you, Jesus. of Amen. failing. Can't lie, can't fail. If you're truly serving Jesus, then how do you explain quitting? Right. Well, they, well, I thought you was following him. Amen. Right. Well, he, that's good. Well, he's the Son of God. Praise the Lord. Selfish people quit. Selfish people build a shelter and go into a mode of self protection. Right. That's good. They do. Yeah. That's Jonah. Why are you building this uh, booth thing here? Protect myself. I thought you was sent all the way here to preach to these people. I did. And I'm done. And that's why I'm sitting out here instead of preaching in there. I'm done. And I'm right here building this booth to protect myself. Can I have your attention? I'll try to make this fast. Nobody follows. <laughs> nobody follows Jesus in a self-made booth of self-protection. Right. Right. Amen. Nobody does. Amen. You can't. Amen. Jesus did not say, if you believe me, then you come after me. But I'm telling you right now, you better learn how to protect yourself because it can get rough out here. And you better be on the watch out. You better be on the lookout because you could get your feelings hurt and you could have some pain. And if you, you, you better be aware and find ways to protect yourself from that. He did not say that. You're going to follow Jesus. You are vulnerable to pain. I pastored the same church in Oklahoma City for 20 years, and there uh, have been a lot of Baptist churches. It's a sad situation these days, in my opinion, for a million three hundred thousand in the whole metro area there, and and how few really thriving, alive Baptist churches there are. It's it's sad and disappointing. But I pastored some who came out of ministries where, you know, they they got pushed around and they got hurt. Anytime anybody would come visit our church, I'd call the pastor or call the church. I often wasn't able to talk to the pastor, and I'd deal with the people and, and as soon as they knew and understood. And sometimes they would even assent and say, yeah, those people are not going to be here anymore, so we just assumed they'd be there. And I had uh, people over the years, my wife could testify to this, we saw people over the years come to Southwest Baptist Church for 10 and 15 years, and I was never their pastor. You know why? Because they trusted a pastor before and they got hurt. Right. So from now on, as far as they're concerned, I'm guilty. Right. They're not going to trust me either. Right. Is everybody with me here? Yeah. And what they did is they got hurt and disappointed and they built themselves an invisible booth right. and they're going to protect themselves. They're going to go to church. They're going to sit there. Nobody's going to get close to us again. We're not going to get involved like we were before. Right. The last time we were that involved, we got hurt in church. We will never get hurt like that again. You can do that. But don't call yourself a follower of Jesus. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. Because you're not. Because you don't follow Jesus in a mode of self-protection. Right. You follow him all the way or not. Yes. Right. Amen. That's, good. And that's what Jonah was doing. Protecting himself. And he became a spectator. A spectator. Um, I've been an Oklahoma Sooner fan all my born days. Had to. I'd have got kicked out of the house if I'd have tried to pull for somebody else beside the Sooners. And so in all those years, I think I've been to five Sooner games, and I've never lived more than an hour and a half away from where they play football. But Saturday's just not a good time to go. But the times I went, I didn't really care if I ever went again anyway. 
Number one, you get a better view at home. <laughs> and number two, you're not put up with a lot of spectators who are there, though OU may be three touchdowns ahead and doing just fine. They're telling the coach who ought to be playing and why that was a bad call and why that player should not even be starting and on and on and on. And there are a bunch of spectators that act like it is our responsibility to come and evaluate and criticize everything that's going on. I'm going to tell you the last thing on planet earth any Bible-believing, authentic New Testament Baptist church needs. Spectators. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's the last thing a church needs. A church is not an organization. It is an organism. Amen. According to the scripture, it is Christ's body. Oh, you're talking about the invisible church now. If there was such a thing, I wouldn't mind talking about it. But by reason of the scripture, there is no such thing as an invisible and universal church. But Dr. So-and-so on the radio, I listen to him. Dr. So-and-so ought to read his Bible and Amen. believe it and right. understand the definition of the word. Right. In this age, the only thing that has any sense at all about a called out assembly is that which is visible and local. Right. It's Amen. ridiculous to have to even say that. Right. It is. Amen. If I, if I said, you know what I'm going to do? I am going to get me a drink of wet water. <laughs> wet water? Yep. Let me see if this is wet. Yep, it is. <laughs> ah, ain't nothing like wet water. Now, what do we know about that? If it's water, it's wet. Amen. Don't we? We know that. Okay, if it's a church, it's visible. Amen. The definition demands that. Right. If it's a church, but I read Schofield's Bible. Nice try, Mr. Schofield. But just read the book and understand the definition of the word. Amen. And it is a called out assembly. And here's the thing about a called out assembly. Uh, it is a body as it is referred to, Romans chapter 12. Right. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Right. Amen. And it talks about the body. And the apostle goes into great detail to explain about how a body functions and a body works. And basically it is that every member of the body is to contribute to the function of the whole. That's right. Now I've tried to think about this and say, okay, now what members of my body would I just as soon be without? And I can't think of any. Amen. I can't think of any. Right. Well, maybe one eye, I've still got one. No, thank you. <laughs> Uh, see how far we could go with that? Right. Now, as a New Testament church, he adds to the body as he sees fit. Amen. I said he adds to the body as he sees fit. Amen. And what is the purpose of every member that is added to the body if it is not to contribute to the function Amen. of the whole? Right. And every member of this church, like every authentic New Testament Baptist church, is to contribute to the welfare of of the whole body. Because the church doesn't exist for me and the church doesn't exist for you. You exist within the church for His purposes and for His glory. Let's get this thing straight. Well, I just kind of go and I guess I just look at myself as a spectator. Well, don't brag about it. That won't work. That's not what it's about. Jonah became a Spectator. What are you doing, Jonah? Just waiting. For what? Hoping things go wrong. Right. Which for him would be right. Yeah. Well, what are, you, what are you looking for? Yeah, you'll see. It's like looking for something bad. <laughs> there are people that go to church just like that. Yeah. I'm not accusing anybody here. Don't, I, I don't know that I could. I don't know. Certainly haven't heard anything out of your pastor and his wife that would make me think so. And while some of us are saying amen to every choir number, somebody might say, and say I remember the last time they sang that, I thought, well, they gotta, hope they don't sing that one again. Well, way to go. That'll help. Be a spectator. Critique everything. That's the last thing on planet Earth an authentic New Testament church needs is spectators. Spectators. You know why? 
Well, I don't say it's not good for you. It's not good for the body. Right. If it's not good for the body, it's not pleasing to the Lord. Amen. We're talking about pleasing the Lord, serving Amen. the Lord. That's what's so sad. So sad. I got to quit. This what's so sad about this is that you think of the story of Jonah and you think about the cockeyed behavior of Jonah rather than the mercy and the long-suffering and the grace of God. This Amen. church exists for His praise Amen. and His glory. Praise and you're a part of it, not so that you might benefit, right. although you will. Thank right. you, Jesus. Amen. But that's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is to show and demonstrate Amen. the kind of Savior that is ours Hallelujah. in Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, Praise don't Lord. quit. Right. Amen. And come out of your shelter and serve the Lord. Amen. And quit being a spectator right. and going home and calling somebody. What would you think of that testimony or that sermon? What would you think of that part of the sermon when he said this? I don't know that anybody's ever done this at this church, but if you've thought about it, don't. Right. Amen. Don't be that. Amen. Give yourself completely to be a Amen. follower of Jesus.